Okay, we are back. My next guest, I'm sure you all know. She's a very charming and talented actress who's starring in a new television series called Hail to the Chief, which is on Tuesdays on, as they say, another network. There are others. Would you welcome Miss Patty Duke? Good to see you. It has been a while. Wait. Wait, wait, what? Can I have the step? You want the little, uh... Can I have the step? <laughs> Thank you. I don't really need it. Yeah. Would I mean, like... I'm actually 5'9". Do you want to be taller? I still want to be taller. Do you know Do you? how? How? Oh, I mean, no, how? <laughs> what are you, about 5'6"? Five, five, <laughs> are, you, are you shorter than that? What? I said, so, I said something amusing. Try five. Oh, come on. Are you really five? Why would I lie? I don't know. No, five feet. Oh. See? How tall are you? I'm five. Under your hat. In meters of feet. Me, uh, five foot ten. In what meters, it would be about and less than two meters, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Me too. Right. Anyway, how are you? It's nice to see you again. Ah, oh, thank you. It's fun to be here. It's been a long time. I thought somebody told me Patty's not your real name. Why did I think it was? Oh, I guess because a lot of people have been saying it for 30 years. But... I guess that would do it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not. No, my real name is Anna Marie. Anna Marie Duke is the name my folks gave me when I was born. And, when did the uh, Patty come along? Uh, the Patty came along when I became an actress. And I went to live with some people who were managers of child actresses. It sounded it had a better ring to it. Uh, well, they decided that Anna Marie was cumbersome for such a little girl. Yeah. And so one day they came to me and they said, okay, Anna Marie is dead. You're Patty now. I see. Twenty years on the couch later, I decided that Anna Marie is quite alive and well. Living inside Patty Duke, but she's there, you know. Yeah, another person is in there. Yeah. Well, well I hard, hardly room when you're only five feet tall. It's kind of like Sybil, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so isn't it true when you were around 20, I guess, you announced that you were going to retire, get out of show business. Oh, yeah. And build an ark. Now, am I might so, <laughs> Stop me if I'm wrong. And build I an wish ark, I could. And build an, <laughs> and build an ark in the desert. Yes, I did. I said that. I well, said now, why that did you because... Say that? Well, because you... I married this guy that I didn't know. <laughs> um, because I was 20 and I was um, a late um, adolescent rebel. I no. don't know. I married this man I didn't... Well, he was a boy that I didn't know. And he said, let's build an ark in the desert. And you I was on that, the Dick huh? Cavett show, and so I told everybody I was going to do that. And three years later, when I still couldn't get a job, I realized it was probably a bad idea. Well, people probably thought you... Don't you think people thought maybe you were just a little bit... Uh, the elevator did not go to the top floor? I wish they had thought that, because that was the truth. I was half a bubble off plum. But they thought I was a drug addict. That would have been easy compared to, you know, straightening out what's really inside there. In other words, what you said was just in jest. You weren't really going to No, no, go. no, I was serious. You were going to... I was serious at the time, yes. Obviously, it was a big jest. Yes. But... Don't you want people to think you're a normal, stable type of person? Uh, yeah, most people uh, think that now of me, and, and most of the time I am. I've yeah. tried to save a few neuroses, you know, because yeah. they, they keep you a little more interesting. You have to have something to pass along to your children. Never looked at it that way. Well, uh, my children have, they, even a psychiatrist who happened to meet my children at a social occasion, said that they were extremely well adjusted. I mean, he, he thought this was quite remarkable considering they're my children. Um, but I decided to, to let them have a few things to keep a little off balance. Not and this morning that. I was taking my son, Sean, who's 14, uh, from the orthodontist to school. And someone four cars back honked. And the kid suddenly jumped and said, Mom, he wasn't honking at you! And I realized that I had really traumatized Mac and Sean because I, I can't stand it when people honk at me. It shoots adrenaline through my body. I'm stuck with it. What do you do? Hit your kids or your dog? What do you do with that adrenaline when they honk at you? Or do that other thing they do, you know? Mm -hmm. The one where you notice their manicure? You, cer <laughs> you certainly changed from uh, when you were 20. Uh, <laughs> You're this young, very This bad. young fellow you married, that marriage Which did one? not last long, did you say? The, no, I mean, it didn't. Oh. It wasn't based on a whole lot, so it only lasted 13 days. Why am I telling you? 13 days? Mom, I'm sorry. Carol Ray, I'm sorry. That's my brother's days. days, yeah. Well, well, who got custody of the cake? I mean, I hardly. <laughs> really... Excuse me. Oh, 
<laughs> well, I don't, don't mean to make light of your predicament there. Oh, well, it's listen. wonderful to make light of it now. Yeah, of course it is. Gosh. This new show you're doing, Hail to the Chief, is yeah. about the First Lady President, President right? Mm -hmm. Which will probably happen. I don't think it'll probably happen, you know, for a number of years, but that's... Yeah, I think it'll probably be a while, but, but certainly uh, Geraldine Ferraro has uh, opened the gates for it to happen and, and yeah. uh, maybe my playing the president, people seeing it every week will will get them kind of used to the idea that it's it's not too bizarre. Well, I mean, the president that I play isn't nearly as bizarre as I am. Yes, really I like. would uh, you know, be in deep trouble. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't see why a woman wouldn't make a great thing. I had a I nice think, I, had I think a nice women would be more I think going. women would be more tolerant very often than men. Well, I don't know necessarily that they're more tolerant. I think they're more well, personally, it's easier for me to express how I feel about something, to be just straight up front with it. I think men have been conditioned to sort of hold the cards pretty close sure. to the vest, you know? Yeah. But uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful group of people, 22 incredible cast members. I hope it's a good hit for you. I hope so, yeah. too. Right, I'm going to cut away here for a second. Okay. We're going to come back. Stay where you are. 13 days. fine-looking crowd. I'll tell you, if I'd have known you were this intelligent, the applause sign would have been in Latin. <laughs> fine-looking group you are. At eight years of age, this young performer was an extra in uh, motion pictures. At 12, she was the youngest star ever on Broadway, and soon after, she became the youngest Oscar winner in history. And just as George Burns went on to play God, this woman has gone on to play the President of the United States, every Tuesday night at 9.30 on ABC television. Ladies and gentlemen, hail to the Chief, Patty Duke. You're not allowed to play Hail to the Chief unless it's the real well, person. Well, I finally found out. What? Uh, technically, it is not illegal to mm -hmm. play it for mm -hmm. someone else, but it's considered to be not in very nice taste. No, no. So I only do it in my house. <laughs> Around the house, you have a little recording. You go dum dum I dum dum dum. The dum. Carpet, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, isn't that fun? It is thrilling. And every time I look at the weekly ratings. I mean, you're already in the top ten. You didn't have oh. to work and pray and slave and... Only for the first 30 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are all, yes, every one of us, there are 22 magnificent cast members. And, and we are all both thrilled and, I think, a little stunned. And, and, that the and audience really learning to enjoy it. it. Yep. To, to enjoy that kind of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And certainly Susan Harris deserves it, who yeah. created the show. And Tony... Uh, Thomas and Paul Witt. Danny Thomas's son mm -hmm. is your producer. Yes, he is. Tony Thomas. As a matter of fact, he was at the White House recently I when his father Danny accepted, the, uh... Uh, is it the Freedom Medal? I ought to know. Yeah. I'm the one who gives it. <laughs> right. But you give so many medals. I know. I was so busy. At least you got a vice president goes to funerals, right? <laughs> we don't have a vice president yet. Are you busy? Oh, gee, I am. <laughs> Do you know that I we talked sorry. about you on our show? I heard you know the other, when the guy wakes up from... Yes, my husband is ill and he's had an out-of-body experience. And, <laughs> and he comes back and he's telling about all of this. And, and the family doesn't quite know how to respond. And so he turns directly to me and says, Do you know what that means, an out-of-body experience? I died and I came back. Do you know what that means? And I say, Yes. You and Shirley MacLaine can do a Merv Griffin team show. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what's already been done? Has it? The out of body, yeah, we did that a couple of years ago. Do it again. I would love to be. I would love to talk to people who've had experience. Even they all see the same thing. That's good yeah. news. Yeah, that's, that's the good news. <laughs> yeah, but we're not sure that those who they came back to talk about it. Those who don't come back to talk about it, we don't know if they saw that big white light. Oh. But they all see a big white light. But they say huh? it's good. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it and they feel that white they light. want to get into that white light, right? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that? I like it's that. It's probably I the really doctor with a big flashlight going, "Hey." <laughs> 
out here. We need every death. <laughs> I try to be. Are you being careful about what you say now as Patty Duke? Because you also play the president? I mean, with your politics? And... Oh, with my politics. <laughs> I thought you meant with my language. No, no, no. Uh, you are a cusser. In some ways, yeah. How do you know that? You cuss. I, I, well, yeah. I heard that. Well, go, we'll come back to that. I want to yeah. hear you cuss. Yeah. Uh, my kids have to learn it someplace. <laughs> what, do you, what happens when your kids cuss? Uh, I tell them that there's a definite double standard. Oh, you yeah. do? Yeah, I do. <laughs> you have to be a certain age to cuss. Exactly. Over 21, exactly. and you can cuss. And they have a great deal of freedom... Uh, because they're very thinking, smart boys, but but there are certain areas where I say, ah, I can say that. It's not nice that I say it. I mm -hmm. wish I didn't say it, but you can't, because I'm the dictator here. We'll return right after these commercial messages. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that that time? I don't know if sure. It, it might help uh, maybe one person, two people in the audience that might be in a similar well, that situation. That would be lovely. That would be right. remarkable and lovely. Because it was a long time before you could talk about that. But well, uh, a, a couple other than your own mother and father took you yeah. over. I'll try and be as, as succinct as I can. When I was about eight years old, there are so many apocryphal stories that we don't really know yet exactly how old I was. Well, I was approximately eight years old. My brother had already been an actor for two years, been discovered by these people, the Rosses. And... Um, then they were looking for a little girl, and my brother said, well, drive my sister, who knows. And they began to work with me, both in a form of acting training and in not speaking like a New Yorker and in how to sit and how to breathe and how to do everything. Eventually, they talked to my very caring but naive mother and insecure woman out of me. Basically, the idea being, if you really love this little girl, You'll let her come and live with us because we can give her everything that you can't. So she did. And in the ensuing years, what started out, I think, I really believe that they had the best of intentions in the beginning, got very distorted as this little machine began to act and get more famous and make more money and become more entwined in their lives in, in many distorted ways. They just lost sight of of what they meant to do in the beginning. I think they never dreamed that it would become what it became. And so it then became a very, what, ugly, very ugly time. But they were not evil people. I don't think they were evil. I think they were certainly misguided and eventually people in deep psychiatric trouble. Mm. Um, and, and they were petrified of losing this little thing which was growing up, you know, and wanted to go out with boys and things. And, and eventually it was a very ugly breakup. And then it's not a reconciliation. He died before I got a chance to say, I'm sorry that I hated you, uh, which was very painful for me. And I'm sure for him. And, and then I got to talk to her and spend some time with her. And then we lost track of each other again. So I, when I tell this story, it's very important to me to protect the integrity that they started out with and, and who, what they meant to be. Right. But it, well, it did become quite a, a bizarre story. It has had a lovely resolution for me. I have a terrific relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. um, we've been able to repair the, the rifts in, in the family with my sister and brother and aunts and uncles and things like that. So I, I came out of it very lucky, much luckier than they did. Might it have been anything like, though, the thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids over the years, millions that have been sent away to a rigid mm, school, finishing school, right, or boarding school, except you didn't have a summer vacation or a chance to return to your family? I also didn't have peers. Ah, there right. were just well, then, the three of us. Problem. And it became a cause celeb that it was just the three of us, the three musketeers. We went on vacations together. I shared all the expenses. You know, all that. Were you told crazy. everything? Were you totally programmed? I mean, with interviews Absolutely. to the press? If we had an interview right. when I was, let's say, 14, and this is no, no slight to your intelligence or your uh, uh, curiosity, but there isn't a question you could possibly have asked me that I didn't have chapter and verse to tell you. And the scary thing is, I saw an interview recently, an old one. The scary thing is that I was totally believable. I watched this interview, and I believed me, and I knew the truth. I think the need to survive was so great 
that I kept doing those terrific performances that I'd been taught to do. Did you want to do those performances? No. No. I was afraid not to. Uh, by then, I was responsible for the support of my mother, the support of these people. And, and they had very glib things they would say that stick with a kid, such as, well, if it wasn't for us, you'd be in the gutter. Mm. Or a hooker. Mm. Or this or that or whatever. And, and they're offhand things, I think, that people say, and they didn't intend them to have that weight or impact. But they did. I mean, I, re I remember and hear their voices to this day. But they were smart. Because they picked yes. someone who is obviously gifted and has proven it to audiences they all over the world smart. many, many times. They were very smart. John and Ethel were very smart, and I think initially very loving. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what amusing thing that happened. I was so programmed to their approval or disapproval that Ethel would go, if I was doing something wrong, say sitting here, she would go, <coughs> and I would know that something was wrong, and I would fix it. One night I was playing Helen Keller on stage, mm -hmm. and they had come to see the performance. I didn't know they were coming. They would come by occasionally and check, and uh, I heard in the middle of the fight scene. In the front audience? I heard, <coughs> and I went, the only time I ever reacted to any sound outside of what I was supposed to be having in my own head as Helen Keller. And it, she had a cold. She had a cold and she was clearing her throat. I hadn't done anything wrong, but I was so paranoid at that point. My mother used to do their laundry by hand. Mm. It, it was a book. You read the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, you're writing it now. I, I'm beginning. Painful I'm beginning. to do? It's going to be, I, I think it's going to be even more painful then my vivid imagination has can, led me to believe. Can you determine what is truth and what is the I child? Hope so. I hope so. I hope that I will be well able to child. state what is a child's perception, what is, what is a memory of a child's perception. I hope to be able to talk to more people who are around during those years who can give me more insight. You know, it is going to be very subjective. And the other, the other probably almost unachievable goal is to be as fair and just to them as I can. I don't want to paint villains. But w with what we know in California, and California was the first to pass the very strict child labor laws because of which was Jackie, Jackie Coogan. Coogan. Yes. Coogan, he right. He just died recently. Yeah. He was a great friend of, of John Aston, you know. Oh, I know. And, uh, but, well, I owed him a lot because of that law, frankly. But if when, I had never met him. But when you came of age, did those people have your money there waiting for you? Well, the law exists in California. Most of my work had been done in New York. So there was some, there was some, uh, but there certainly wasn't what might have been had we been involved with California laws. And uh, which, by the way, I'm a staunch uh, supporter of, of having those become national laws. Sure. Um, most of it had gone on the good life. You know, we chartered boats, and we went to the Bahamas, and we went around the world, and we, took, you know, and I but, paid half. But did you know... There was only know... one of me. On the show, I, I played two people on the Batty Duke show, but there really was only one of me. Did you know anything when it all broke up? I mean, what do you mean? Other than acting, did you know anything? Did you know how no. to do anything? No, no, um, I went through a period of time where I wasn't working, couldn't get... get you know, an acting job. And I decided to try one day just to get a regular job. And, and I went to, the, to a place, the ads of receptionist. I thought, well, I can do that. You know, I have a nice voice. I can talk nice to people on the telephone. They didn't believe me. They thought it was a joke. And I couldn't, <laughs> because I was bad at dude, I couldn't get the job because they thought it was just a put on. They thought it was candid camera we were doing. They so, knew it was no, I didn't know anything else. I, I, I fantasized going to college. That was always a great goal of mine. I'd always been promised that I would go to a fabu fabulous finishing school in college or whatever. But I always had a job. Mm -hmm. So there were thoughts of that. But really, acting is what I do. And when I stopped being frightened that I wasn't going to work anymore, I started to work again. And I know that, that there's a reason that I was born with this gift. And this is what I'm supposed to do. So then you didn't hate it when you did it. It was, no. it was I hated it at first. When I was a kid, I hated it. When it, I was a kid, I hated it. Well, I mean, eight, nine, ten. You had to keep your socks clean and your shoes on and all that stuff. And I didn't like that. 
Um, and you had to be nice to everybody. You had to say you liked peanut butter when you didn't so you could get the commercial. Um, <laughs> but once I started really working, I worked in live television, in dramatic live television, uh, just before the end of it. So I worked with people like Sidney Lumet and Gloria Vanderbilt and uh, wonderful actors, Sir Lawrence Olivier. And the approval that I got from those people and the, tr the honest love on a very spiritual level was the beginning, I would think, of an addiction. And I truly loved it mm -hmm. and, and still do. It has been very good to me. All right. Going back to the personal, though, as so rehearsed and programmed by this couple, uh, what to say, what to think, what to do, what everything, was it then, and then having no friends, no peers, school, then when you got out into the real world and found that you had to have relationships, were you able? No. <laughs> no, you have to learn it from someplace. And I don't ever really know what their relationship was, just the two of them, because we were all three together all the time. I never, there was never such a thing as them interacting with each other and a kid watching a, a parental relationship or a, a man-woman relationship develop. I was very bad at it. I married very young. Um, everyone told me not to, and of course they didn't know what they were talking about. And uh, well, you probably had to do it, didn't you, to find? Um, I, I to think get your feet I wet. think probably following what, what is probably a prototype at this point. Yeah, it was obvious that that was the move that was going to happen. I married a lovely man. It didn't last. He's still a lovely man. He still thinks I'm a very nice lady. Uh, and then I went through even more what delayed stress teenage syndrome right. <laughs> rebellion and and uh and acted out you know what what most of our kids do in the house or in the neighborhood right. which is embarrassing enough mm. i did on television so that's when i went through that really painful and 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 um what crazy time right. and you have three sons of your own i have i gave birth to two I have, I have mothered five. Three miracles, or? <laughs> there were three stars in the East. <laughs> no, John came to the marriage right, with three, three boys, right. David, Alan, and Tom, and uh, we have Sean and Mac. Now, now Sean and Mac are actors. Yes. Mac Can you is believe our... it? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I also, I think I sat on this show, this very show, and said, no, no mine no. will ever be an actor. That's right, and both of them are. They heard okay. the show and said, we'll fix her. <laughs> And uh, one of them's on, what, uh, Facts? Uh, uh, Mac McKenzie is a regular on the Facts of Life. Right. He's the preteen heartthrob. Right. And Sean is uh, uh, in a movie called Goonies, a Steven Spielberg, Dick Donner movie called Goonies. Goonies. Now, I've got two teenage heartthrobs. Do they know your life story? Yeah. Um, one of them, they've sort of been told ribs and drabs through the years. You know how it comes up at dinner, you know? Mm -hmm. um, or not. Or not. <laughs> um, but one of them recently read an article that was in a, a magazine, and it was a very accurate, very honest article. I, I admired the writer very much for the job that he did. And he was sitting outside. I happened to be in, in my room, and the window was open. I was watching him, and he was reading it to a friend. And I could hear a little in his throat, you oh, know? Geez. And there were some revelations to mm -hmm. him. I mean, nothing major that would traumatize him, but just, I don't know my mother went through that. Mm -hmm. And when he finished, he put it down. He's not even, he doesn't even know that I was eavesdropping. But uh, put it down, he turned to his friend and he said, ha, you never know from the way we live now that she went through that, would you? And then he had to go play, because it was, it was, he's a very sensitive kid and he, re he related, I guess, being a kid actor now. And, and he just really didn't want to have to deal with all that weight just then. Mm. But I thought it was a lovely cover that he did, you know, with his friend, mm. to tell him everything's okay now. We'll take nice a break. Boy. It sounds like it. We'll come back with Patty Duke. Music from fame star Nia Peebles. Patty Duke has been elected president of the Screen Actors Guild. Duke, backed by outgoing president Ed Asner, defeated actor Ed Nelson, who was supported by Charlton Heston. The SAG presidency was once held by then-actor Ronald Reagan, who served six terms at various times from the 40s through the 60s. An anti-abortion or...
Patty Duke has been a card-carrying member of the Screen Actors Guild for three decades. And now, after paying dues to the Guild and paying her dues in her chosen profession, the Duke has become the president. Scott Osborne has more on only the second woman to hold the title of president of the Screen Actors Guild. In the best sense of the term, Patty Duke is a professional actress. Since her Broadway debut at age 12 in The Miracle Worker, through her latest TV movie, A Time to Triumph, she has earned the respect of her peers. Working with her, I mean, and I've always enjoyed it.